Welcome back, word nerds. Mike here with the social life of language, making complex theories simple but never simplified. If you think that sounds cool, hit that subscribe button now. Today we'll be covering the article, Clarifying Translanguaging and Deconstructing Named Languages, A Perspective from Linguistics, by Othegi, Garcia, and Reed. Before we start, full disclosure. A couple years ago, Ophelia requested that I make a video on translanguaging, which I did, and I strongly recommend that after this video, you go back and watch that one too. I'll put the link up in the corner. Now, Othegi ended up seeing this video, and he told me, Mike, you gotta make it really clear that translanguaging and code switching are not the same. So in this video, we approach this question again. What's the difference between translanguaging and code switching. Let's find out. First, a clear statement. Translanguaging does not equal code switching. Imagine translanguaging and code switching are two perspectives standing on the opposite side of a mountain. What can be seen, what's going to be observed is totally different. In this article, the authors use this idea of perspective. Translanguaging is an insider's perspective, while code switching is an outsider's perspective. I want to start on familiar territory. Let's clarify code switching and the outsider's perspective first. This takes us to a major keyword in the title of this article, named languages. What is that? It refers to linguistic systems that have been named by various institutions or group of institutions. For example, a group of linguists or a state government. Names like English or Spanish or whatever. Code switching does not question the idea of a named language. Let's ask some questions. First, how does a language get a name. Let me tell you a true but generalized story. To begin, we might perceive a linguistic feature. Feature 1, F1, and then also feature 2, F2, and F3, and F4. We might make the claim that this cluster of features that we just perceived are used by this particular group of people. We then draw a box around these linguistic features. And then we say this group of features constitute what we call a language. A language named English or Spanish or whatever. Let's ask a bigger question. What reason did we have at some point in history to describe, to list words, to create grammar books, and then give a name to those linguistic features. Those linguistic features that were spoken by some group. We can't just pretend like we didn't have a reason to do it in the first place. Let's build on our story. If we look at history and the emergence of named languages, we are talking about colonizing institutions who had an interest in studying the people they were colonizing, usually to subjugate and govern them. This might require they go in and they study their linguistic practice. And since colonizers have a dependably racist view of the people they colonized, they would study and categorize their linguistic practice as childlike, as primitive. So if this is obviously not English, then we should give this another name. So they get their own linguistic category, their own name, their own box. To be more blunt, these colonizers, these outsiders, brought with them a very specific set of assumptions of what constitutes a language and essentially forced other people's linguistic practices into those boxes, into that set of assumptions that they brought with them from the outside. For example, if a certain number of linguistic features were observed across a certain number of people, suddenly we start seeing linguistic patterns. Suddenly we start assuming there is a stable linguistic system. This set of assumptions about language is from an outsider's perspective, literally. In essence, colonizers would not simply discover a group of people or discover some land. They would also discover new linguistic systems, much in the same way Christopher Columbus discovered America. From a different perspective, we can also say that he, along with 
historiographers, along with map makers, along with soldiers, along with the nation state that financed all of these adventures. Together, they invented America. Now, mapping was an important part of the colonial enterprise. Those maps were made from the outsider's perspective, not from, for example, the colonized people's perspective, who probably had a totally different way of perceiving the land. So importantly, these maps are made from an outsider's perspective, not from for example, the colonized people's perspective. In the same way, we can think of the discovery of linguistic systems as mapping linguistic features from an outsider's perspective. An outsider that says, oh, these are the important parts, these are the less important parts, these are the important patterns. This makes up the grammar, this makes up the system. This is a linguistic system that needs a name. On top of that, the colonizers might say something like, hey, you can participate in your own colonial governance, but using our ideas of what a language is. And we already mapped out your language, and it's not modern enough to participate in governance. Here's the thing. Named languages do not just exist. They often have violent political histories. Named languages remain very important to governance to this day. When you get right down to it, we're a nation that speaks English. That's how they will become successful and do great. So I think it's more appropriate to be speaking English. So when we talk about named languages, we almost always forget the postulate that a named language is a social construct, not a mental or psychological one. We are standing outside of the speaker's head, observing, categorizing, listing, documenting, measuring. Observations that, depending on who is doing the observing, will notice certain things, but not other things. We'll say that's important, that's not important. This has value, this other stuff does not have value. For example, if you are a school leader in charge of assessing language competence, you will likely be using tools developed by the nation state. You are using very specific criteria, and you're assuming that those name languages have always just existed, and that there is some neutral way to measure this thing we call language competence. This is what is crucial here. When we talk about code switching, we are observing from an outsider's perspective, while also imposing a very specific social criteria onto language users that were developed throughout history. Notice that up to this point, we have not talked about the speaker's perspective at all. So let's pause right here and let's overview what we've said so far. When we are talking about code switching between named languages, we are assuming quite a few things. First, we assume that named languages exist in nature. We forget about all the historical processes that actually helped invent those named languages. We forget that somewhere along the way, there was a group of people or an institution or a nation state that had a political interest in inventing or discovering linguistic systems. And the next assumption follows from the first. We believe that sorting out linguistic features into named languages is a good starting point for language learners. So then what follows from there is we start attaching value to certain linguistic features and not others. We say, this language is good in school. That is not. This language is good for a job interview. That is not. This language is appropriate here, but it's not there. So when we talk about code switching, no matter how positive we spin the idea, the authors say, the notion of code switching still constitutes a theoretical endorsement of the idea that what the bilingual manipulates, however masterfully, are two separate linguistic systems. Two separate named systems. But remember, we named those systems after the fact. Yet we try to teach language learners as if our language learning brain naturally accepts those divisions between linguistic systems. Because supposedly that's just the way language works. So that must mean our brain works like that too. But translanguaging is like, 
Nah. So here's why we can't say code switching and translanguaging are the same. Translanguaging posits that learners work from a unified collection of linguistic features, not naturally separated into systems into named languages. Again, let's be clear. Code switching assumes that our brain naturally sorts out these linguistic features, naturally puts them into boxes. But everything that we've been talking about thus far reveals that those boxes are not natural but historical political inventions. Recent ones at that. In terms of language teaching, the idea of code switching assumes that teaching within the parameters of a named language is probably the best way to teach language learners, but also the natural way to teach language learners. Translanguaging is challenging us to adopt a perspective from inside the learner's head, the insider's perspective. That split between named languages is not built into our biology. It's not built into our brain matter, but we enforce that split every single day from outside of the learner's head, especially in schools. For example, in the United States, English Spanish bilingual children were constantly categorized as mentally retarded because surprise, the tests that were used to measure something called mental capacity rejected a giant chunk of a person's linguistic features, of a person's linguistic abilities. Put another way, those linguistic features just simply didn't count on that test. It's the same reason black children were also categorized as mentally retarded, because they weren't speaking the language named English, they were speaking something else. They were speaking a language named African American English. And those linguistic features do not count on the test. Let me ask you a serious question. Has that kind of language assessment in schools really changed? The authors say, translanguaging is the deployment of a speaker's full linguistic repertoire without regard for watchful adherence to the socially and politically defined boundaries of named and usually nation state languages. For example, a child growing up in a household that speaks the languages named English and Spanish is usually not learning to talk under social political constraints. But as soon as a child steps into a school, we immediately start restricting some linguistic features while valuing other linguistic features. Those restrictions, those evaluations come from the outside. They are not part of natural psychological mental processes. So what if we thought about language differently without the rigorous enforcement of named languages, without attempting to measure what a child knows while simultaneously suppressing all the linguistic features that are in the wrong named language. Wouldn't we actually be able to tell how brilliant a child is? Wouldn't we be able to assess even better where a child actually needs help to succeed? So translanguaging privileges the learner, privileges what is going on inside the learner's head. Code switching privileges social evaluations from the outside, from the outsider's perspective. Okay, this stuff is really complicated, but you might feel the difference now. But I spent most of today's video clarifying the assumptions underneath code switching. If I clarified anything here, I'm hoping that I clarified that code switching and translanguaging are not the same thing. This is where you go watch my other video on translanguaging. There I focus on translanguaging much more. Well, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter and go support this channel on Patreon. You can also download my publications off of academia.edu. This is Mike with the Social Life of Language and we're done.